So great to see so many people in an actual space. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. And welcome to our briefing on the importance of value-based health care, by which I mean coordinated, integrated care that is accountable for both costs and quality, and the importance of maintaining incentives in our very complicated health care system to draw more doctors and other healthcare providers into these value-based arrangements. I'm Susan Denser, I'm the President and CEO of America's Physician Groups, and my colleagues at our co-sponsoring organizations today, the National Association of ACOs and Premier, we all subscribe to two really important points. First of all, that value-based care is the key to the future of U.S. healthcare. And secondly, incentives to get people into value-based care, like the 5% bonus on the Medicare physician fee schedule that's available to clinicians who go into advanced alternative payment models, that is the key to the transition to value. None of us, and certainly nobody on this panel today, believes that the true promise of value-based care has yet been achieved. But none of us believes that there is a realistic alternative to value-based care. And as I say, the bonus is key to it. I want to call your attention to a few things in your packets today. First and most important, the speaker bios. Uh, we're going to rocket through our panel, so not, there will not be long introductions, but please take note of the tremendous backgrounds of the folks who will be speaking on the panel. Um, next, I want to draw your attention to a quick fact sheet on the uh, 5% AAPM bonus here. If you don't know what that is all about, this fact sheet will help sort that out for you. Uh, finally, I want to tell you about a letter uh, addressed to the congressional leadership and signed by more than 800 physicians, hospital executives, and others who want to call attention, the attention of the Congress to the importance of this 5% AAPM bonus and the fact that it expires as of the end of this calendar year. Um, and unless it is renewed, this very important incentive to get providers into value-based care will die right along with it. So extremely, extremely important items. And I should also add that there is a new congressional sign-on letter being pulled together by Congressman LaHood and colleagues. That will be making its rounds over the next few days. Those of you who represent members who've not yet had a chance to sign on to a letter, you will have a chance to sign on to that dear colleague letter in support of the AAPM bonus. So it, once again, I urge you to take a look at all of that material in your packet. Before we get going with our panel, and before I introduce our esteemed panel moderator, Mark McClellan, I want to introduce uh, our esteemed congressional representative who's been able to join us today, Congressman Brad uh, Wenstrup. Uh, some of you may know that we were very much hoping that Ami Berra, congressman from California, would be able to join us. He's had something come up, inevitably, as happens, uh, but he sends his... Uh, regards and congratulations uh, for all of us uh, being here today on this to talk about this very important issue. Back to Congressman Brad R Wenstrup, who represents Ohio's second congressional district. He's a co sponsor of the Value in Healthcare Act, the vehicle that carries, among other things, the extension of this 5% bonus. Before the congressman came to his position in Congress, of course, you may know he earned a degree. Uh, as a podiatric physician, after completing his surgical residency, he established a private practice in Cincinnati and treated patients for 26 years. And now in Congress, he brings his experience as a doctor, an Army Reserve officer, an Iraq War veteran, 
and a small business owner to help Congress tackle the economic and health care and security challenges facing the no nation. He's a member of the Ways and Means Committee and the Intelligence Committees and also serves as the co-chair of the GOP Doctors Caucus. In 2005 and 2006, he served a tour of duty in Iraq as a combat surgeon, got a Bronze Star and a Combat Action Badge for his service, and during his time in Congress, he's fulfilling his reserve duties by serving as the Medical Policy Advisor for the Chief of the Army Reserve, as well as seeing patients at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda. So, like most physicians, his heart is still in treating patients, and he understands, I think, almost more than anyone else uh, in Congress, the importance of having coordinated, integrated, value-based care for patients. So join me in welcoming to the podium now, Congressman Wenstrup. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate that, and I also appreciate uh, the kind introduction and the opportunity to engage in, in the conversations of the day, as it, especially as it pertains to value-based care. You know, we, um, uh, it, was, it was mentioned, I started with my own practice uh, in the late 80s, and I can remember at the first couple years of my practice, especially for an office visit, I gave patients their bill, they paid it, and then they submitted it to the insurance company. Well, things have changed pretty uh, dramatically since that time, and I also just had two employees, and if someone was sick, my mom came in to help. Um, th then I joined a large orthopedic group, and it was a great way to practice. And the experience that I've had with, it, with the Army to be able to serve in wartime, but also to serve at Walter Reed, and I, I think I'm maybe one of the few people that's been both a patient and a provider in the military system, the VA system, and in, and in private practice. So I've had the opportunity to see both sides of a lot of ways to go about practicing medicine and to try and keep people healthy. As was mentioned, I serve as one of the co-chairs for the GOP Doctors Caucus. And what we're trying to do, and why so many of us here with medical backgrounds on both sides of the aisle, have, have come to Congress is really to be not just a voice for physicians, but a voice for patients and how things affect patients when we make decisions here. You have a lot of people making decisions that never saw a patient. And, and they, they set policies and they see things on a white piece of paper where we're envisioning a human being that we're trying to take care of. And so uh, I will say that with our GOP and when we get together bipartisan, our leadership turns to us for our guidance and, and expertise on how things affect people in, in health care. And we put, uh, we put patients over paperwork, if, if you will. And we want to take Washington really out of the doctor's office and the doctor-patient relationship. We're dealing with a lot of issues on that. And, uh, you know, I'll get into that a little bit because value-based care has an opportunity uh, for us to um, do both things, which is really do the best for our patients and still be engaged uh, with Washington, D.C. or the government and whatever role it has in, in health care. But I remember I first started really, we were always about outcomes, we were always about getting best outcomes. I think that's just part of medicine. And you, you would see if you start your own practice especially, uh, you want to increase your volume of patients that you see. Well, that comes with getting good outcomes. That comes with the reputation that you develop over time. And then as your volume increases, then your pay increases. Uh, but, you, but if you also reduce costs, that serves to your benefit too. So how do you balance the two things of providing the best possible care while reducing costs and coming forward with best practices? You do that within your own practice. And so what we want to be able to do here is to incentivize a good value and to, to reduce costs. Sometimes we see, though, that when you get better at something and you reduce the cost of something, then someone, someone will say, well, then we don't need to pay you as much because you've reduced the cost of it. Well, that, that, that takes away the incentive of doing that, and we need that good blend of how we do this. We don't want to penalize people also with that will take on high-risk patients because that's always more challenging. We don't want doctors cherry-picking, saying, I only want to see these patients because I can get good outcomes with them. You know, you have to build in the ability to take on some of the tougher, tougher patients. Um, 
So one of my our priorities really is to move away from the, just the fee-for-service model and to focus on quality of care. And, and I think especially in the primary care setting, you know, uh, you think about the cardiothoracic surgeon that'll you know, split open your chest and go in and replace the arteries on your heart and save your life and give you many more years of life. Now that's a tremendous talent and that doctor should be rewarded for that. But what we don't really do in our system is reward the doctor that prevented you from ever needing that surgery. And I think we need to focus more on those types of things. Prevention is the key. Prevention is the key to best practices. Prevention is the key to value-based care. Prevention, to me, is one of the keys to um, it's, it's savings over a long period of time as well. So it just seems that that's a practical uh, way to go. Uh, I do know a primary care physician, actually one that I served with in Iraq. I was talking to him recently, and he said, you know, to me, I feel like I failed if I have to admit someone to the hospital. So how do we drive that? How do we, how do we make people healthier longer? And so I think that value-based care serves our health interest as well as reducing health care costs. But medicine is tricky, you know. We, obviously, it, we're really talking about forms of insurance and payment and things like that. But medicine is very tricky compared to, say, car insurance, you know. If you, uh, if you have a lot of wrecks, if you drink and drive, if you text and drive, well, your rates are probably going to be higher because you're going to have some accidents. So, but in medicine, there's not only the risk of bad behavior that can drive up your costs, but there's also the risk of bad luck. And that's different in healthcare. You know, no, no one said, uh, oh, it's my fault I have this glioblastoma, right? It just doesn't work that way. But it might be your fault that you have lung cancer because you smoked three packs a day for 30 years. So how do we incentivize, again, going towards health, incentivize the patient as well? And I think that that's uh, really one of the ways we have to look at things. I also want to look for other models, for example, on how we can maybe consider people with chronic diseases. Take diabetes, for example. A lot of people are budgeting with their health care. Well, maybe if we allowed them three visits a year without a copay, they might be better monitored by their physician and, and we have better outcomes and ultimately save in the long run by providing that type of a benefit. So we, we talk a lot about lifespan. We always look at numbers. You know, what's the lifespan in America? Well, if you take out suicides and overdoses, we do pretty well. We can keep people alive for a long time. But let's focus more on our health span, and this is what I think value-based care does, is focus more on how do we keep you healthier longer. You know, none of us are getting out of here alive, not one of us, you know. So at the end of the day, why don't we try to focus on keeping people as healthy as we possibly can for as long as we possibly can until those final days come to us. And I've seen different things that, that, that um, are really drive health. Uh, I was at Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, and they said, well, we take one of those Medicaid programs where it's per capita. So these are our kids to take care of. No matter what they have, we've already been paid, or this is the deal, this is what we get. And he said, how, you know how we make it work? We make sure we keep them healthy. We make sure we follow up. We make sure we're proactive. Have, have, has every child in this program gotten the vaccinations they're supposed to get? You know, how many times does a kid come to your emergency room with, say, some fungal pneumonia before you go to their house and figure out where the mold's growing so that you can prevent this from happening again? These are the, these are the ways we have to start thinking going forward, I think. And this is just one op opportunity. So I want to thank my, my colleagues, Representative uh, Delbeni, LaHood, Welsh, for joining me in, in co-leading the Value in Healthcare Act. Uh, I think, in my mind, this bill makes some common sense cha changes to some of the program parameters for alternative payment models, removes some of the barriers or red tape that uh, maybe inhibit somebody from wanting to join in on these programs, and hopefully will encourage more participation. Uh, and, and also, it increases technical support for physicians to decide that they do want to get into this. So we want to drive best practices without penalizing efficiency, without um, making it more difficult. Uh, and, you know, as you look and you see faster and full recoveries for somebody because of some new innovation, that's a good thing. I, I think back to uh, in our practice when uh, it came out and said, you know, if you have a patient that's been in the hospital and they get readmitted 
uh, in a certain amount of time, you're going to be penalized. Everyone's going to be penalized. I thought, well, that doesn't seem fair. You know, you might have had them in for pneumonia. They go home and break their hip. But I will tell you what it's done is it's, it's made us, and I'm just speaking from the surgical standpoint, is it's made us to start thinking out of the box and say, well, how do we go home with the patient? You know, we like that we're doing more surgeries outpatient. You know, it's better for the patient to, recovery at home, to recover at home. But if we just say we're going to see you in two weeks um, after the surgery, you may not know that they're falling. And so now we send patients home with pulse oximeters. We're getting their vitals every day. We're keeping track of where they are on a daily basis. And so these are things that have led to better practices, better outcomes. So it makes us think outside the box when we offer these types of, of models to work with. And in the end of the day, reward for those best practices. So I think that um, you know, the physician payment model is, is very important. Um, and, and we need to provide certainty, and I think that some of the changes we can make to this will provide some more certainty uh, for physicians. It's an important part of, of your practice. Um, you know, I look at uh, uh, the VA and I look at the military. Uh, they, don't under, they don't operate under the same environment that uh, private doctors and hospitals do where you have to be in the black to keep your doors open. And I can remember going back before I was in Congress, uh, we, our group was subject to Congress not finishing and figuring out what to do with SGR, the Medicare payments. And so they said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll just retrofit it, keep seeing Medicare patients. Well, that's easy for them to say, but that's pretty costly. We're still paying our staff and everything else and not getting reimbursed. And so we had to go to the bank and get a line of credit, you know, just to, just to keep our doors open uh, through that time. So there's responsibilities here and a lot of things that we can do here in Congress to make things better. And I just want to um, uh, let you know also that we have an RFI out with many of my colleagues, including Dr. Barra, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Great to work with on these issues. Uh, we're asking for feedback. We're asking for feedback on how to stabilize the Medicare payment system uh, while ensuring that we have a successful value-based care incentives in place. Uh, the deadline for RFI, if you just want to know, is October 31st. But I, I just want to thank you all for, for what you're doing because really what we're trying to do is make things better for patients, have better outcomes, increase health span rather than just lifespan. So thank you very much for having me today, and I hope you have a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you heard it from Congressman Wenstrup. It's a priority to move away from fee-for-service medicine. It's important to balance the achievement of great outcomes with reasonable cost. It's important to incentivize this value in care. By doing so, we can reward prevention and reward efforts to increase the health span. We can reward thinking outside the box. It's not just the patient in front of you in the surgical unit at that moment who matters. It what happens, happens to the patient who leaves the surgical unit, goes home, and has to be helped uh, through rehab and everything else. All of these integral components of value-based care. We're going to start by showing a brief video that our groups have prepared because we understand that although a lot of us live in the world where we talk every day about value-based health care, when you trot that phrase out in front of patients, they sometimes don't have the foggiest idea what you're talking about. And in fact, when you say the word value, a lot of people hear that as value health care. Isn't that right at the corner of Kmart and Dollar General? <laughs> They don't hear what the rest of us hear. So we put together this video to show people, regular people, patients, uh, we call them people, what it means to have value-based care. So let's roll that video if we could, and then I'll introduce our, our panel moderator. What do America's patients want out of healthcare? Ask Gary Gruntz, who suffers from a number of chronic conditions. Like many patients, he wants a doctor who understands him and looks out for the full range of his medical needs. Here's Gary's wife, Fran Gruntz. 
Recently, Gary was diagnosed with the atrial fibrillation, which would then cause him to go into um, congestive heart failure. He couldn't walk more than a few feet. He, he just could not do much of anything. Eating and sleeping were probably all he was able to do. So I'm seeing Gary for the last uh, 15 years as, as a patient. And in the beginning, he had the problem with the hypothyroidism, COPD, and atrial fibrillation. But then he translated into getting diagnosis of multiple myeloma and amyloidosis. Patients like Gary want a care team in which nurses and others work together to plan and coordinate their total care. That means not just addressing their medical needs, but their social needs as well. Each day I talk to Fran and Gary and I get an assessment of his mental health and his physical health. Through listening, I was able to decipher what they needed and I was able to devise a plan with them, not for them, but with them. We set daily goals of exercising on the treadmill and eating a heart healthy diet. Our weekly objectives were able to give him more responsibilities around the house. Now he is assisting with daily chores, babysitting for his grandchildren. Because of the care that I'm receiving, I feel better than I have in years. Value-based care like this has not only helped Gary, but it's also helped people like Bernice. She's a recovering cancer patient, and like Gary, needs a team looking out for her total well-being. We focus so much on preventive medicine. So we have social workers, we have physical therapy, we have um, home care dimensions that goes to the house and does sleep studies. And these things make it easier for our patients to take care of their other needs. Doctors and their care teams, delivering what patients need and improving their health and well-being. That's the value in value-based healthcare. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing my long-term friend, Mark McClellan. Mark is the Robert J. Margolis Professor of Business Medicine and Policy and the founding director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke. He is, of course, a former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, where he developed and helped to implement major, major reforms in policy. The fact that some of the earlier experiments that CMS undertook to nudge Medicare and Medicaid, and in fact the entire U.S. healthcare system to value, actually took place during his service in the George W. Bush administration at CMS. And that, of course, followed on some of the earlier steps taken by the Clinton administration, uh, that were then succeeded by the Obama administration, now the Biden administration. All of that bespeaking the fundamentally bipartisan nature of the value movement. Much of the work that the Duke Margolis Center uh, now undertakes focuses on this journey, as does Mark's own work. In addition to his role at Duke Margolis, of course, he's a member of the National Academy of Medicine. He chairs the Academy's Leadership Council for Value and Science Driven driven healthcare, and he co-chairs the guiding committee of the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network. Mark is going to lead us in a discussion with these distinguished physicians who are living in the world of value-based care day in and day out. So now I'm going to turn things over to Mark McClellan. Mark, welcome. Um, Susan, thanks very much for that kind introduction. It's great to see you again. And it's great to see so much interest in this topic of supporting value-based care. As Susan said, this is an idea that's been around for a while. It was a while ago that I was CMS administrator, but I still remember leaders from healthcare organizations coming in to see me, not just to ask, not to ask for more money. I got a lot of those meetings too. I'm sure you all do as well. <laughs> But to ask to be paid differently, they talked back then about steps that they could take to help people like Bernice and Gary that you just heard about by doing things like tracking them longitudinally, using private secure data to see, to make sure they were getting access to the medications they need, filling their prescriptions, coming in, being checked on, monitored for their chronic diseases, to pay for team approaches to care, including farm 
uh, pharmacists, uh, uh, advanced practice nurses, uh, social workers, community health workers, because that's what really mattered for some patients. And they pointed out that, look, we're actually, we care about this stuff. We're gonna do, we're gonna try to do this anyway, but number one, there's only so much we can do if we don't get paid for it. Number two, to the extent that what we're doing really saves money as well as improving care, we're not helped by that. We get less billing for those cardiac surgeries and admissions that uh, we just heard about from Representative Westrup. So, you know, that made complete sense, and, and it's led to some of the earlier reforms that Susan mentioned was a key factor in the bipartisan support for the accountable care organization approach and for the centers for, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And over the years, we've learned a lot about what steps in this general move towards paying for what patients need, paying for health, along with more accountability for what really matters, quality, outcomes, costs, uh, affordability, how to do that well. Most of these reforms are still voluntary. Healthcare providers don't have to do it. And as you might guess, healthcare organizations are reluctant to sign on if there's not a clear path to getting to success. And these are reforms that we've seen and you'll hear about take some effort to implement successfully. It takes real investments of money, time, um, engagement with care teams to f and, and with patients to focus on what matters most to them and to do it successfully. The good news is that despite all of these challenges, many of these reforms are succeeding in lowering costs and providing better patient-centered care. This includes Medicare's now biggest value-based payment program, the Medicare Shared Savings Program. Just had another report from CMS recently about significant growing net savings in that program, which now undergirds the support for millions of Medicare beneficiaries across the country. It also is behind the newest uh, major reform effort from CMMI and CMS, the so-called ACO REACH, Realizing Equity, Access, and Community Health Model. This is one that, again, keeps building on what we've learned, in this case, about finding ways to help reach beneficiaries that have been hard to reach because they live in underserved areas, they come from traditionally underserved uh, backgrounds, and they often have distinct health needs and barriers to care that frankly fee-for-service just isn't able to address. So very important for addressing the administrations and really I think all of our priorities around health equity and making sure everyone has access uh, to the best modern care that they need. Now today you're gonna hear from some of the participants in these Medicare value-based programs that have succeeded in improving care, reducing unnecessary health care costs, improving equity. These approaches have used not only the new payment models, but those AAPM bonuses that you heard about earlier and that are a big uh, topic for our discussion today. The AAPM bonus helps with the big shifts, the new investments needed for organizations to deliver care differently, to set up and implement those teams, to implement the data reforms, uh, to really get out there and meet the patients where they are. Looking ahead, there may be some ways to make this bonus more effective. For example, to recognize shifts in care and payment, not only in Medicare, but in Medicaid and commercial insurance, where this really matters too. Uh, but it's clear that the bonus program has been important. Over the last three years, uh, healthcare has been hit hard. Now, that's led to some very important congressional action and relief, and healthcare is facing some challenges today with inflation, workforce disruptions, and continued stresses in areas like behavioral health. Healthcare organizations are struggling, and you all are being asked to, to help them out. So, what I want all of you to think about is what is the best way, most important way to do that? There is talk of Congress taking further steps. One way to do that would be to increase fee-for-service payments again. But there's a difference between financial assistance to kind of help keep things in place where they've been and financial support to change them to where they need to be for the future. 
You heard it from Representative Westrup. You see it in your own lives and people you care about. Medical technology is changing. We're getting better at early diagnosis. We're getting better at recognizing and addressing the social factors that get in the way of everyone getting access to the best care they need. And we're getting better at intervening early to change people's disease course, to give them a much better uh, experience of care and, and, and patient journey. That's only gonna happen if we keep reinforcing this shift. We can try to do it through adding on a payment here for telehealth to adding on a payment there in the, uh, in the, in the fee for service rates, but those individual changes don't come close to supporting the needed reforms in care uh, to get to the goals that we'd all like to see and that you're gonna hear about now from leaders of healthcare organizations that have used these AAPM bonuses to facilitate their shift into advanced, comprehensive, person-based care. So I'm very pleased to welcome four people. I'm gonna introduce them all right now quickly, and then we're gonna hear from each in turn and have some time for a discussion. Uh, first, Dr. Kisha Davis, a family physician who's Vice President of Health Equity at Allidade. Uh, thanks for being with us, Kisha. Uh, next, Dr. Robert Fields is the Chief Population Health Officer at Mount Sinai Health System, a largely urban system that's dealing with a, a wide range of complex patients and advanced healthcare needs. Uh, next, uh, Dr. John Regis, who's Business Development Executive at Village Medical. That's an advanced primary comprehensive care uh, practice system in uh, a growing number of locations around the country. And then finally, last but not least, Dr. Richard Schumann, who's CEO of Baycare Health Partners, a physician hospital integrated organization in Western Massachusetts out in uh, Springfield uh, that's delivering more comprehensive care through these payment reforms. So we'll turn to each of them and we'll look forward to some discussion. Please be ready with your questions and comments too. And uh, Keisha, maybe if you could go next. Sure. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Keisha Davis, a family physician, vice president of health equity at Allidade. We are um, an accountable care organization or accountable care organization ena enabler. We have ACOs um, in over 35 states across the country. And really when I think about um, the APM bonus, I think of it really as a way of helping to promote health equity and equity in practices and practice recruitment. So when we think about the benefit of ACOs, we know that patients that are um, vulnerable uh, benefit when their physician is part of an ACO. However, we see that ACOs tend to, are less often in places that are poorer, uh, have more minorities, have less well-educated. ACOs tend not to be in those areas. And so if we really want our vulnerable patients to have the benefit of being part of an ACO, we need to really make sure that they are in those areas. Practices in those areas um, don't need a little bit extra support to be able to participate in an ACO, and the APM bonus really does give them that incentive uh, to participate in ACO models, giving them that um, extra support financially in terms of developing that infrastructure that they need to be able to participate and be successful in value-based care models. We know that there are um, startup costs, and having that, uh, that bonus payment from the beginning really helps to incentivize that. I'll give just one short example and then pass to my colleagues. Uh, you know, one of our practices in Arkansas, we have a group of practices that we recruited because they see a majority minority patient population. One of them, when they joined, was on the verge of closure. And when she, you know, I asked her, you know, what happens if you close, if your practice closes? And she says, my patients will die, literally, because there are no other providers here to see them. And having that extra bonus, having that support and that infrastructure. Yes, it helps her as a physician, but it helps her reinvest in her community. It helps her practice stay open. It helps the patients that she is serving. And so really thinking about how those investments in practices in communities really go a long way to help our patients. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Davis. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Fields. Hey there, uh, my name is Rob Fields. I'm a family doc also, um, and uh, I'm the chief pop health officer at Mount Sinai. We're our eight hospital system in New York City with our largest hospital on the Upper East Side. And if you've been there, you know that we're literally straddled on one side by some of the highest per capita income on one side of our hospital, and very literally on the other side, some of the lowest per capita income. And we serve all of those folks. About almost 70% of our patients come from Medicare, Medicaid, or uninsured. Uh, 
you know, payer support that, um, and so it, we we don't survive without caring for patients that um, really struggle often, especially on the Medicaid side with access and feeling disenfranchised for lots of different reasons. Um, but the reason you know I, I think about this work is uh, I actually started my career when I opened my, my own practice at a residency with a friend of mine, and I speak Spanish. We were, the, other than the health department, the only bilingual primary care practice in the 20 county region of Western North Carolina. Big chunk of my panel was were Medicaid folks a, as a result, because that's the insurance that most of those folks had. And we, I almost lost my home uh, trying to, and it was, volume was not our problem. We saw lots of patients. We were very tech forward. We had a patient portal like in 2006 and doing e-prescribing back then. Um, but all of it was overhead and realizing that the fee-for-service system was not supporting the care of the people that needed my help the most, back to, to Keisha's example. And it made me realize that it has to be a, a better model. And frankly, why taking that approach, and it's very similar actually, just much larger at a system like Sinai, it's the same problem. Caring for the patients that need us the most is complicated. The folks that are disenfranchised in our poorest communities um, in, or, or are older and chronically ill find it difficult to navigate the healthcare system, right? All of you probably have had that experience on a good day, and I would guess that you have many more resources than most of the patients that we serve. Um, and it's only through a different model that isn't widget-based. I teach a pop health class, and so we're a widget-based system. We provide services, we get paid for those services, and we don't have to guess what the outcome is. 20, close to 20% of our GDP on healthcare with outcomes that are on par from a life expectancy standpoint to Chile and the Czech Republic. It, we don't have to guess. So thinking about you know, value-based care as a different model to provide um, certainly something, more, something closer to equitable outcomes and also saving the taxpayers' um, dollars is, is important. And the APM bonus is an important part to in incentivize systems like ours that have scale to participate in these programs. Otherwise, it's, it's a pretty challenging environment to take that level of risk. So look forward to talking more. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Dr. Fields. Dr. Regis? Thank you so much. One might wonder, well, what is this OBGYN guy up here talking about primary care? <laughs> and um, let me tell you, I have a, probably one of the most unique stories of how I got involved in primary care. Um, just to be brief, I started off at OBGYN and had a single specialty group. They grew very rapidly, primarily taking care of, of Medicaid uh, moms in some of the largest urban areas of the state of New Jersey. By the mid-90s, we were probably doing 15% of every Medicaid delivered in the state. Then I had a problem, what did I do with these babies? So I started PEDS. Then we started adult medicine. And by 2000, 2005, we went to 60,000 patients, 5,000 Medicare patients. So this is how I got into primary care. And I can tell you that in the old FIFA service environment, uh, especially in a, in a predominantly Medicaid space, and you gotta remember New Jersey was 48th in the nation in Medicaid reimbursement. We were getting paid 12 bucks a visit. I mean, okay, so we had to be nimble and we actually had to expand our patient bases. So I started acquiring practices in more affluent areas, uh, uh, adult medicine practices, to even out that payer mix because Medicaid wasn't getting it done in the state of New Jersey. And then what happened was, and I have to give you an example because the pandemic uh, changed everything. Um, people seem to forget what happened during that time. I did. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys know. Well, let me tell you, when you, you're in a, a primarily a fee-for-service environment, you got 18 offices, 40 providers, 150 staff, and for four months or five months, no patient comes through the door, uh, you learn how to pivot and learn how to survive, or you don't survive, and some practices didn't. We went from seeing two to three telehealth visits to 100%, and probably within 10 days. And during that time, we went through, we went through two different systems to get to the telehealth that worked for us. Um, but the other thing that I found out is that we were in value-based programs, we, uh, we were in incentive programs, we were, in, we were in CBC Plus program, and those programs provided dollars not based upon fee-for-service so much to help us keep the door open. <coughs> and what it allowed us to do is, okay, let's look at other ways that we can provide value to our patients. Where are we falling down? And especially during the pandemic, Patients weren't coming through the door. Uh, how, do we, how do we reach them? Now, patients who are, who are diabetic and who, are, who uh, had other uh, chronic conditions, how do we keep up with them? So we had to, I mean, we, we literally had to think on our feet. And one of the things I did, I hired one person to just look at annual wellness visits. We were doing two or three a week. And you know, annual wellness visits is, is the fulcrum 
for most Medicare patients as they enter into the healthcare system. Where I, I hired one young lady to do that, we went from doing two to three to doing 80. And her, the money to hire came from value-based programs. Then I started looking at my attributive lives, and we started calling patients and finding out they didn't even know where I was a primary care doc. I bet you half the people in this country don't know who the primary care doc is. It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. So we started reaching out to them. Uh, if you missed your appointment, at telehealth. All this would not have been possible without the additional revenue that made our practice actually survive. And then the, the, the rate limiting step was when I started talking to payers in New Jersey. New Jersey kind of lagged behind other states in terms of value base, in terms of risk contracting. But we started having discussions, and I knew then that I didn't have the bandwidth to really look at risk, because risk is what it is. It's risk. And that's when I uh, reached out with Village MD. Village MD acquired my practice. Village MD's main purpose is to empower primary care docs, looking at value, how, do we, how can we reach these communities, uh, their partnership with Walgreens. We opened up 1,000 uh, uh, co-located clinics. 51% uh, had to be in geographically underserved area. You know, Walgreens has some of the best real estate in, in, in the country. And a lot of it is in urban areas. Can you imagine how a game changer that would be getting care to those geographically underserved areas if we could convert, do some de novo? Because elsewise, the economics, even to this day, don't support going into an urban area. There's a lack of docs. The doctors left. In New Jersey, the payment methodology uh, are actually earmarked for death local medical doctors. Camden, for Camden City, Camden, for example, one of the poorest in the nation. Now it's coming back. 80,000 people. You know how many docs in the community? Zero. Uh, Atlantic City. I looked at the picture one day and they had 12 black docs in 1936. You know how many today? Zero. So, okay, how do we address that if we don't look at payment methodologies, payment structure, incentives, manpower issues? Are we, are, if you're not paying folks, providers, docs, they're not going to want to go into primary care. You, it, so we, we have to totally relook at how, it, not what's more important, but primary care drives health care in this country. So we, it, it, it needs to be reimbursed and looked like, like other specialists. So those issues uh, uh, Village is trying to address by reaching out to physicians and creating those kind of coordinated efforts. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Dr. Regis. And to say, too, I, I've seen that around the country as well in the, in the work that we do, not um, just uh, OBGYNs as a specialty, <laughs> uh, refocusing on, on what really matters for the population of patients they serve, but other specialties, too. I've seen a lot of um, uh, specialties like uh, um, cardiology for patients who have cardiac care needs get involved in understanding what the underlying risk factors are. The White House just had a conference yesterday on um, on uh, food, uh, um, hunger, and nutrition, just how important addressing nutrition can be for reducing uh, uh, risk factors for heart disease. And there are some successful models in Medicare for treating patients with kidney disease from more comprehensive care perspectives with uh, nephrologists taking on some of these roles about uh, being there to coordinate care and, and get patients what they need. Um, next, I'd like to turn to, to Dr. Schumann. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm truly honored to be here. Um, I'm just going to tell a little bit of a story. Uh, several years ago, I was asked to do some consultation down in New York, actually in Long Island, uh, for a group that was just coming up in value-based care. They really didn't know what value-based care was. That was kind of cool. I went down and I spent some time there. And I remember uh, having the opportunity to sit with a primary care physician. I'm a primary care physician. I was pretty excited to talk to this person. And uh, I asked him a little bit about his diabetic care. <clears throat> well, that was the question to ask this gentleman, because he couldn't, he was so excited to tell me every aspect of his diabetic care. He, would, he shared like his exam that he did and how magnificent his documentation was and, and the questions he asked and he went on and on and on. And then um, he paused and he looked at me and he goes, you know, I really am quite an awesome physician. <laughs> and I was like, in my mind I was like, but not so humble, <laughs> but, but definitely awesome. Uh, and, and I said, okay, well, I just have a, a question. I had done some research in his practice before I, I went there, and I said, how many 
diabetic patients do you take care of in your practice? How many, how many are in your panel? And he paused. And he's like, I don't know. Hmm. And I said, well, how many diabetic, how many of your patients that are diabetic do you see a year? And he paused. And he said, I don't know. Well, I told him that he has about 500 diabetic patients in his panel, and he sees about 200 of them uh, every year. And I said, what do you think about that? And he paused, and he said, I'm still an awesome doctor. <laughs> and it made me think the, the same question about myself, like, how awesome am I if I'm only seeing a small percentage of the patients who need to see me? And it reminds me when we talk, you know, we use a lot of big terms, a lot of acronyms, value-based care. But to me, it comes down to the same thing. You know, I'm a primary care physician. I have a population of people to take care of. And if I just think about the people that are in front of me, then I'm not really doing the job. Healthcare, for the three decades that I've had the pleasure of doing it, is one of those things where it's very easy just to look at what's in front of you. Just get through your day. Just see those 20, 25 patients and get home and have dinner. Um, and, and the way it's reimbursed has always been, the more I see, the better I do. So there's no incentive ever to really think about, as this, this gentleman in, in New York, those other 300 patients that you really were not even addressing or thinking about. Value-based care is that opportunity. It's that opportunity to be proactive as opposed to reactive. Fee-for-service medicine is always reactive medicine. What shows up at your door? And until we change that paradigm, we're not going to give the care that we all up here want to provide. Now, um, family medicine, internal medicine, you know, People that go into that go into that field because it's a passion. And we want to be able to take care of that population of patients. Value-based care allows for that. And this 5% bonus, which may not seem like you know, 5%, how does that make a difference? That makes such a difference in the way that we can take care of the, that entire population. It changes the way that we have resources to build the infrastructure to find out who those people are, to reach out to them, and to, to provide them the resources that they need to stay healthy. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I think that's part of my story is to try to make value-based care relatable to people who don't live in healthcare. Um, so. It's a, it's a great story. Thank you very much. You all have all had some compelling stories and, you know, I know, especially over the last few years, it's been a, a, an extremely challenging time in, in American health care. And um, uh, Dr. Regis, you talked a bit about the experience in the pandemic and how being in these value-based models helped with um, steps like uh, being able to and already being engaged some in, in going out and finding your, your patients, as we just heard about from uh, Dr. Schumann, and uh, having the um, ability to scale up uh, telehealth, having a team-based approach to help um, what individual clinicians could do go, go further. Um, we've done some studies at, at Duke Margolis, and I recommend them to anybody, showing how organizations that went into the pandemic already with some value-based care involvement did better financially, did better in terms of engaging patients, had less staff layoffs, et cetera. So we're kind of past that stage now, but it still seems like a very challenging time for healthcare with inflation, uh, with um, um, higher rates of behavioral uh, opioid uh, disorders in this country, not to mention other unmet needs that many healthcare um, uh, systems have gotten behind on during the, the, the pandemic, and a lot of very stressed, if not burned out, healthcare providers. One of the other things we've seen in, in the value-based care experience is that, um, and Dr. Schumann, you kind of alluded to this too, that this is um, experience with care for clinicians that's better aligned with why they went uh, into healthcare in the first place and helping them focus on what matters for patients, not what matters so much for, for reimbursement. Could, we're at an important time here for, for Congress, you know, heading into the election and then 
session after where these issues are, are gonna come up for sure, why is it so important to provide more support for value-based care now at a time when many practices are hurting? I think a lot of people are just saying, well, shouldn't we just you know, pay out more money and, and, and try to shore up these uh, very stressed practices? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. I mean, I, I think from my perspective is that um, it's not really about doing more, to your point, Mark. I mean, there's a, there's a significant amount of stress, both financially, we know that many nonprofit health systems uh, across the country are uh, hurting quite a bit with labor inflation, supply chain inflation, et cetera. Uh, and then the needs of complex patients in particular don't go away, and in fact, there are more, right? We have um, many thousands of new Medicare beneficiaries coming every day. They skew, obviously, older um, in Medicare, and with that comes an increased burden of chronic illness and other issues. Um, not to mention all the socioeconomic pressures that many of those patients face. So the work doesn't stop, and so the issue in terms of why now is that you, it, the system is very stressed. And so in, in order, uh, in the current model, the only recourse is to do more, um, and there is no more to be had. You, you can't squeeze any more out of the system without continuing to burn physicians, nurses, other staff out and create, and certainly not to achieve a better experience for patients with a volume play. And so it has to be different, not more, but it has to be different, and it's different care. And uh, using community health workers, using advanced practitioners more, using behavioral, behavioralists of all licensures more, that doesn't happen in fee-for-service for a reason, because it's not structured to provide care differently, it's just structured to provide more. And, and I, I think that's why, and now with the, with the system under intense stress, that we have to rethink the way we deliver care, and that only happens with a different financial model. I just want to emphasize it's not more, it's different, right? And if we continue to do more, that doesn't get us where we need to be. So if we use our resources in a different way, in ways that, that I think would we would all look at and say, God, that would be great for myself, my family, my parents. You know, I, I look at, at providing health with dignity. And so why do we not provide services at more at people's homes? You know, my father's 93. He goes to the emergency room way too often. But in value-based care, you can create systems where people go out to the house for a lower cost, but a better outcome. I'm always shocked when people look at emergency rooms and say, oh my God, 70% of the people that go to an emergency room are not admitted. They go back home. What, what is the deal that all those people are going? It's because we haven't set up a system to make sure that they have the resources out in their, where they live to meet the need. And there are lots of programs like that, whether it's embedded care managers who actually are calling the patients, maybe doing home visits, whether it's EMTs that are in an ambulance go to someone's house and actually do an ER visit in their home. Those kind of things are different and better. And it's not more. Um, and I think we just have to embrace a system that does that because I think we'd all prefer the the people to come to our house as opposed to going to the ER and waiting 10 hours and then being sent home. We just need to embrace that system with the dollars that we spend in the fee-for-service system in an alternative system. You know, I'd just like to comment because I, I think I, I try to keep it very simple. Are we saying we want to go back to fee-for-service? Is that the alternative? Uh, we know that uh, from an economic perspective that that doesn't work. It's not sustainable. So we that system it should be off the table. It should be off the table. So what should be on the table is being paid for outcomes uh, because the fee-for-service model doesn't work, not sustainable. And so I, I, it, it's amazing that the, it's, it's obvious you've got certain ACOs, even Nichols is saying ACOs are actually working. They're saving money. They're providing better care. Um, you would think, What's the problem? You're getting financial results. You're getting better patient results. You think that you'd go forward with those models that, that look at value. Because you can't go back. <laughs> you can't go back. And um, Akisha, did you have a comment? Yeah. I can just give an example of my own practice. Um, and so 
I started at a community health center and then uh, was at a private practice that we opened really on the promise of value-based care. And value-based care hadn't come, didn't come soon enough to save us. And we were living in a fee-for-service world. Mm. Um, we had home visits and we had behavioral health and we had very strong care coordination and we couldn't make it work because fee-for-service didn't pay for us to provide care in that way. Patients loved it. I felt like I was giving the best care to patients that I have ever given because I was able to maximize my team from when they walked in the front door to that front desk person who knew them to the nurse who would call to follow up and make sure they got their labs done and whatever study happened and follow up with when they were in the emergency room. And we didn't have a payment model that, to, that incentivized that for it to be able to continue. It closed too soon because the payment models didn't, um, didn't come for us to be able to keep that model of care open. Providing good care, patients were happy, physicians were happy, but we didn't have that reimbursement to really support that model. Um, I want to ask one more question and I open up to all of you, so I hope you all are, are, are ready. The, in order to support these reforms, we're talking today a lot about the AAPM bonus. That means advanced alternative payment model. Alternative payment model is not fee-for-service. Advanced means significantly uh, yeah. not fee-for-service, so not <laughs> just a, a toe in the water, a little bit yeah. of uh, money maybe away from fee-for-service, but a lot, a lot of payments that are uh, at the person level, which means the healthcare organizations are really accountable for health, for, for, for improving the outcomes, reducing the costs. The more advanced versions of these models, like the ACO REACH program, which has um, uh, gotten a lot of organizations signed up that are serving um, those underserved areas. Like you said, uh, uh, Dr. Davis, you know, we didn't have those reforms before. We do now. Uh, those are big big shifts away from fee-for-service, and the advanced APM bonus is essentially about providing some help in, in moving to that. Can, can any of you talk about why just a little ways away from fee-for-service isn't going to get us where you think we need to be, why an, an advanced uh, alternative payment model adoption is needed, and, and therefore why the, the APM bonus is so relevant right now? Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> well, there's, it, we're heavily weighted in primary care here, so I'm going to um, I'm going to I'm going to not make my primary care comment. I'm going to make at my own risk here a specialist comment, right? Because I think that sometimes we we don't always emphasize how much of healthcare cost comes from specialty care. Um, I was speaking with a local kidney uh, physician who shared with me something I already knew, that 1% of the medic, uh, that nephrologists, uh, their population of patients makes up about 1% of the Medicare population and 8% of the overall Medicare spend, mm. um, which is a huge d amount of dollars. And this nephrologist is part of a value-based contract with me, and he he talked to me about this 5% bonus, and he's like, I use that mm -hmm. money to hire nurse practitioners to make sure that my patients can get the care in their homes that they need and that they transition out of the hospital to their homes and don't get readmitted. You just don't hear specialists talk like that. <laughs> they just don't. Uh, and, and so a small step away from fee-for-service makes that nephrologist say, eh, whatever. You know, I'm not going to hire a nurse practitioner. I'm not, I, I, I'll use my, that money. I, I, I'll just see more patients. A large step makes that nephrologist think, huh, maybe I will do something. There's enough in it here to actually invest in, an, in a meaningful way in an alternative model. We need specialists to be engaged. And I, it's amazing, you know, they also want to do the right thing, and yeah. you know, they often get a bad rap, but they want to do the right thing, too. We just have to allow them to be engaged and be part of the larger picture. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I'm doing now is for villages that we're putting together a subspecialty network. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the ways we're looking at using value-based funds is hiring coordinators to coordinate that care between that subspecialist and our primary care docs. 
to get more subspecialists into our network. That we, that we share and get share uh, um, EMR, get sharing analytics with, with those subspecialists, looking at value together, maybe even download and subcap them uh, if, we, if we're in a f more full risk environment. But that coordination piece is a very important piece and, and s some additional funding to hire those coordinators uh, uh, to work with those subspecialists as they work with our primary care docs, I think it's key. Because you can't have primary care without specialists being involved. Yeah, so people with complex illnesses, specialist yeah. care is so important in that coordination. Absolutely. That that's a big Key. that's a big shift. Yeah, please. I, I, and I think all the operational reasons are totally right. I mean, we could list lots of examples that are highly relevant. But I, I would also say this: that um, currently, I think we have less than half of Medicare beneficiaries are still covered under some value-based arrangement, despite the growth. Right, which has been great, but slower than I think most people have hoped. And I think the APM fact sheet talks about the expectations of how many physicians would qualify for the payment. It's actually a lot less than what we thought. So it's not as fast as we thought. Right now, it's sort of like the first people in line for the new iPhone kind of thing, the early adopters. <laughs> and and that are, are and for the most part, I think, leading with a high degree of mission and then trying to figure out how to make this work and often serving you know uh, populations where, the as we've already said, the model doesn't work. But I think for this to scale, you know, I, I started changing my language with our finance folks. It's like if the moral argument had been enough, which I think we've just in the short time made a decent case that this is a more just way of providing care. But if, if the moral argument had been enough, we'd be doing it already. We're not, right? And so that has to be strategically important. And there's something about incentives, right? We, we, the system does what it's incented to do. And if, I think maintaining incentives like this uh, really pushes or encourages larger scales, large and small scale systems and networks to participate in these programs because it's strategically important and it's also the right thing to do. That's a, it's an alignment that doesn't exist in any other model. I think the last thing I'll add is just that um, it's not like you can go from fee-for-service today shut down and then, you know, yeah. jump into an APM model tomorrow, right? And so there is a level of investment in infrastructure that needs to take place um, in understanding the data, in hiring the support staff. And really, our physicians have grown up in fee-for-service. They're baked in that. And so it takes more than just saying this is the right thing to do, this is the moral imperative, to really help them make that investment, to make that transition. And there's a lot who want to do it, but without having that financial support to be able to hire the people that they need to hire, to be able to make the technological investments and upgraded EHRs and in other systems to be able to do it. They just can't make the switch and they will continue on this hamster wheel of fee for service and not really be able to get to that next level and how they think about caring for their whole community and not just the person who's sitting in front of them. I think that's so important. Yeah. I, I, just one last quick, yeah, quick comment mm -hmm. is that I, um, when I hired the one young lady uh, to do the AWVs, I started what was called my Practice Transformation and Quality Institute for my company. And we hired one young lady to look at our AWVs. And then we hired another, another uh, employee to look at our attributed lives, to look at our ER admissions, to look at uh, our, our um, uh, uh, hospital admissions and whether we were seeing them fast enough before after they were discharged. Uh, look at those kind of utilization issues. Next thing I know, because of those, the revenue that that was bringing in, that department grew to 14 people. And uh, we just had the ability to use that initial pop that led to additional revenue, that led to additional staff, and led, led to better quality care, more contact, more access, more contact, and more touches with the patients. Well, thank you all very much. I'd like to bring in uh, everybody else into this uh, really uh, uh, interesting discussion and timely discussion. Um, comments or questions? Great question. And just so we get in as many of these great questions as possible, everybody doesn't have to answer everyone. So uh, I'm sure who wants, to, who wants to take this one? OK. Um, so I think in order to be successful in value-based care, you need not just yourself and your group, but you need a community that's going to support that. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to take care of patients and the administrator at the hospital, the CEO of the hospital, all they want to do is fill their ER and fill their hospital um, and, uh, you know, heads in beds, and you're, you're a practice in risk and you're like, you're trying to keep people out of that hospital. Um, that 
is often a very challenging way to manage uh, value-based care. So I guess one of the things I would really think about is understanding the environment, um, because if you live in a massive fee-for-service environment and you're the lone, lone group trying to do a value-based care, it can be a very challenging start to that endeavor. My rec I, would, I would recommend something very, not very simple, but there are very good value-based models out there. So if you have somebody just getting ready to get into that, go visit them. See what they're doing. See how they made the transition. Nothing better than an example. Maybe one quick add. I know you said we don't all have to answer with yeah. <laughs> well, well, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Davis was listening to that, but no, please go ahead. Uh, uh, I, I would really strongly encourage as you're building models to pass incentives through everyone on the team. So like if you're gonna drive a change oh. in culture and operations, don't, you know, when you take, like the APM bonus is a huge example, but even any shared savings payments, things like that, uh, you really, it, uh, building it through operations so the physicians understand it's part of their revenue, the front desk staff, the MA team, ways to really use those incentives to change culture and operations. And, and that's where the advanced APMs help, and, and the bonuses too. But they give you that money up front to help make these investments and help everybody get off the treadmill and get body on. So another question here. You know, th thanks for your comments. You know, I just came up this morning from North Carolina. Um, we also have a Duke Margolis office here in Washington for those of you who want to work with us as well. But uh, North Carolina has implemented something similar in their Medicaid program. They did a shift. Uh, um, this is bipartisan support in, in Medicaid to shift from a fee-for-service based system to one through managed care organizations, but with a requirement of moving into advanced uh, alternative payment models linked to data, and it's been extremely helpful for improving access for vulnerable kids and other underserved populations. And I know, um, Dr. Davis, you maybe you could comment on this general topic too, since I know this is, kind of, this is where your background comes from as yeah, well. Yeah, this, this is kind of my passion. So, you know, one, just to comment on um, thinking about population health and value-based care and the interplay between them. And, you know, value-based care for me, I think, makes population health personal. You can't be successful in population health um, without thinking about the individual patient. And the promise of value-based care is you're thinking about the whole population and you're also thinking about that individual, almost like a puzzle. When I'm putting together a puzzle, I'm looking at that whole puzzle, and then I'm also looking at that individual piece. Where does this individual piece fit in this puzzle? Just like where does that individual patient fit? What do they need um, to be you know, part of this bigger picture? When I think especially around um, Medicaid and the promise of value-based care there and how we think about guardrails that need to be in place, um, you know, you, you, there has been this kind of push to, you know, Medicaid ACOs and, uh, you know, more money in that area. And I think that, that that is important. What we want to make sure is that the quality is going along with it, right? So if we're seeing savings in Medicaid, which is already a program that is underfunded, sometimes $12 a visit, <laughs> is that savings coming at the cost of somebody not receiving care? And so when we're looking at that savings, again, it comes back to how is that being reinvested back in the community, whether it be Medicaid, Medicare, commercial payers, all of these value-based care systems. The promise is taking that savings, reinvesting it back so that we are, have the ability and flexibility to look at social drivers of health, um, those things that might be getting in the way of patients being successful in their care. And so how are we taking that funding, that pot of money there, right, if we've got that limited pie, and making sure that it's getting rein reinvested. And I think the promise of value-based care is that we are tying ourselves to quality outcomes and not just financial goals, right? We want to see the quality outcomes in there as a dependence on that, and that benefits the patients. Yeah, the, the budget savings is certainly important to state legislatures, but so is the challenge of addressing all those unmet needs that have, uh, that have existed for uh, for too long in many Medicaid programs. Other questions or comments? Yeah, in the back. I, I'm, I'm not aware of any you know, formal studies around that. All I have is qualitative information. Um, New York is a little problematic because many of our allied staff are unionized and it gets to issues in terms of payment. Um, I can tell you in North Carolina, uh, just in our network, qualitatively, I would say there was definitely tremendous satisfaction and buy-in, but I, unfortunately I don't have any hard data to say that retention was better over a long period of time. Uh, I will say on the reverse side for the physicians, um, you know, we've seen, I think as referenced earlier, 
uh, we're not unique, uh, but mass exodus, if you will, of many physicians post, you know, during the pandemic and post for lots of different reasons related to some version of burnout. Um, and many, certainly in our area, are going to more like private equity backed areas and because, frankly, because they are embracing value in a different way and they're, they're being told they will not be forced to shove a lot more value, uh, volume, sorry, down their throats and they're being often promised and, and, and for good reason, right? And more staff, behavioral health, clinical, all those support structures that the traditional systems have been slow to adopt. So I would say that it, I, I think almost the reverse is true. Like if we don't pass the in, incentives through or change the incentives and the models and provide those services, they become, they're, we get, end up with workforce issues, right? Because they're, they're just seeking, that's what the physicians are seeking. What do you mean by allied health? Usually it's anyone who's not uh, typically like to greed, uh, but support the asset. Sure, it's, 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 a, it's a very good question. Probably look I, at your own budget. I, I, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, we try to get the MAs involved and we, we, we're looking at a bonus program for them for the down road, but I don't, I don't think the system is mature enough in certain areas, especially in New Jersey, where, where the knowledge and uh, of how to operate in, in these value bases and also going towards risk uh, is, is there yet. But that has got to be part of, the, part of the, the equation. It has to be because you can't run an office without it. <laughs> so there's got to be a way where, where the, the allied uh, folks share and in, in, in this increase in revenue that everybody's talking about. Yeah, there is a lot of data on um, bigger share of um, total spending on patients going to primary care. And if you look within the primary care, just like all of you talked about, um, it's not just primary care physicians. It's, it's these other team members, too. So there's some data on this, even though we're still relatively early in yeah. diverse uh, programs. So we got time for maybe a couple more questions. I know some up here in the front, and I'll go to the back. Yeah, yeah hi. Joyce Reedon from MedPage Today. You mentioned about um, Medicare shared savings programs and what a success that was. I wonder if you could talk about some of the other models, because my, my understanding is that some of them uh, aren't doing as well. And, and Maybe you could also address the idea of getting physicians new to this to do uh, double-sided risk. Yeah, maybe I'll leave the double-sided to the group, but just very quickly on the other models. Um, CMS recently did a big review of their 10 years of experience under the um, uh, ACA and the, uh, and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and, and their conclusion was the need for moving from uh, a bunch of um, uh, models that early on were trying out new ideas to a much more systematic approach. And I think the takeaway from the Medicare Shared Savings Experience and other programs that gave upfront payments, like one called AIM, to, to small practices was that that was a way to go as a foundation for comprehensive reforms. So we've seen the new or relatively new strategic goal from CMS of, of aiming to get all Medicare beneficiaries into these comprehensive relationships because of the success of models that especially begin with comprehensive care and then um, the advanced models there too. Hard to get into, but um, uh, growing evidence there as well. I was going to sort of try to answer your second question about yeah. two-sided risk. Um, I guess I kind of think of it, it's, it's interesting, you know, people like to have to control over their own destiny. So if you're a physician and you're like, okay, if I see 25 patients today and I bill them, I'm going to make a certain amount of money and I'm going to have a paycheck and I'm going to be able to, you know, pay for the groceries and all of the expenses I have in my life. It's, it's very, it's somewhat predictable. You actually have a sense of, you know, your panel sizes. There's, it's a very predictable kind of model and providers kind of like that. Now you're looking at putting them in risk and they're saying to themselves, huh, I have to succeed in a completely different way. I could actually lose money, working really, really hard and lose money and you want me to be in downside risk. <laughs> Why am I doing that? And, and, and how are you going to convince me to do that? Um, and I think that, that, look, I'm a huge believer. Uh, most of my, you know, most of the contracts we're in are downside risk contracts. Um, but it is not an easy sell. Um, and I think that, that it is a transition that providers have to believe in. And, it's, and so my general feeling in that, I think the MSSP has done a tremendous job at this, is that they've gone from, okay, there's really only upside benefit and you can progress through MSSP from a sort of uh, upside only 
to like, oh, wow, I feel pretty good about this. I bet if I took a little more risk, we could even do a little bit better, invest more. Um, so I, I think it is a, a journey. And I, I always look at new groups when they come to me and they're like, oh, we want to we wanna be in this big upside, downside risk. We're going to make a lot of money. Because people only think about when they make money. <laughs> they, they don't actually ever think about the opposite of, oh, my God, I have to write a check. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so um, I believe in upside, downside risk, as long as it's reasonable and fair and the budgets are, are reasonable. But it is a journey. And I, I would say that, that physicians uh, feel more comfortable with it once they've been in upside only for a while and a path to, to, to both. And we'll just add that the all the more reason to maintain the APM bonus, right? And when you're thinking about that and you're thinking about, well, gosh, I, I can't really afford to write the kinds of checks that I might have to write for a large Medicare population. Um, I need to think about stop loss insurance, et cetera, all those kinds of things that you don't normally think about in fee for service. Well, the APM bonus provides some incentive, some protection, if you will, right? That, uh, that if things go upside down because you, know, you weren't, for whatever reason, um, that you at least have some protection against those downsides, which could be significant. Well, a really good question. I know there are more. Um, we are out of time. Uh, um, I hope uh, these excellent um, uh, clinical leaders may be available for questions like right now, if you have any quick ones or, or certainly in, in follow-up. Um, I do want to thank uh, especially Susan and APG, NACOS, and Premier for bringing us together today, um, Representative Wenstrup for his leadership along with what's really a bipartisan issue. Isn't it nice uh, this close yeah. to an election? to be able yes, to have meetings uh, like this. Um, and then especially all of you for taking time out of what I know is a really busy schedule on these critical issues. Thank you all so much for joining us Thank today. You. Thank you.